you for coming. Welcome to New Jersey. Uh, please don't forget to wipe your feet, especially if you're coming in from Manhattan. Um, this is a talk on the history of the museum, which is actually quite a fascinating history, considering that it's not a very long history. People kind of assume that museums have always been around, but that's not really the case. We're going to explain the details of that as we go on through the lecture. So um, this is where we're going to start. I have to use my little arrows here. I'll put that here. This is who I am. Uh, I can introduce myself. Uh, thanks to Eric, by the way, and the Troy Library and the Friends of the Troy Library for arranging this whole talk. Uh, but this is who I am. This is a book I wrote. It is called, oh, yeah, closed capture. Okay. This is called The Art of Looking at Art. It is available in the Troy. Oh, there's Eric holding it up. It's available at the Troy Library. And uh, it's a general guide to everything having to do with art. And I personally think it's fascinating, but I may be prejudiced. In any case, uh, here is my email address. If you'd like to contact me for whatever reason, this is my website where you can see my artwork and find out what I'm doing exactly. And the six hour art major list of all of my upcoming classes. So without any further ado, let's start with the welcome slide. This is a slide from a retrospective of the British street artist Banksy. Uh, Banksy is known for his rude kind of anti-establishment stencils that have been uh, spray painted onto, building, on, onto buildings all over the world. He's also been known in the past to kind of hang his, hang his own paintings up in museums when nobody's looking. He's sort of a prankster and he had a retrospective um, at a museum and this was the welcome sign to that. It was at the Bristol Museum in England. So by now, museums can be found on all seven continents, including Antarctica, what we're looking at here is, believe it or not, a museum. It's called the Lame Dog Hut, and it was established in 1988 uh, as part of the Bulgarian Museum of uh, His of yeah the what's it called the officially Bulgaria's uh, National Museum of History in Sofia, Bulgaria, the capital city, uh, and this was a hut that was built in Antarctica and it originally housed Bulgarian scientists who were studying in the area and now it houses a bunch of artifacts having to do with Bulgaria's early exploration of Antarctica. So it is officially a branch of their official museum. However, as I said, museums are a fairly recent addition to the landscape. The idea of saving others uh, artifacts is kind of new. In the past, if you uh, overtook another civilization, chances are you would destroy every vestige of that civilization because you had conquered them and you didn't want the people to know that their uh, civilization uh, was a you know, developed civilization and you wanted to institute your own rules. So very often you would just wipe out any memory of who had been there previously. Of course, there are uh, exceptions to this. For example, the Roman Empire just kind of fell apart over the course of a couple of hundred years and people just moved in when they had the opportunity to. Uh, then you have maybe like the Qing Dynasty in China, which was the last ruling dynasty of China up until Sun Yat-sen established the Chinese Republic in 1912. Uh, that's the dynasty that the movie The Last Emperor is about. They were Manchu from the north who had invaded China. It was only the second time that China was ruled by foreigners and they tried to ingratiate themselves to the populace. And they really uh, respected everyone's tradition, at least on the face, in order to you know, rule over people who were very varied. Very, This was when China was at its largest and the population was very varied. And they had to appeal to every group of people in their empire. So they made uh, moves toward incorporating local customs and uh, ingratiating themselves to the public that way. Uh, in any case, uh, yeah, you also have an example of uh, one uh, regime totally wiping out any vestige of the previous regime would be, for instance, Mao Zedong's China. Uh, in the 1960s and 70s, he staged a cultural revolution where he tried to wipe out any uh, memory that China had been an imperial state in order to establish the communist state. So that's an example of what usually happened. So uh, the uh, collecting is not new. People have been collecting things ever since uh, for at least 100,000 years or so uh, in South Africa, outside of a cave called Blombo's Cave. They have actually found shells that were thought to be used for jewelry. So people collected things. Uh, that's also where the first 
purposely made marked object in the world was found with some stones with some uh, carvings in them. And that was also in the same cave. But people have always collected things, whether it's cars, whether it's art, whether it's coins, people just like to have collections. But there really have not been too many places where people went strictly to see that collection. That's a fairly new idea. So the word museum comes from the Greek word mauseon, uh, which was then turned into the Latin word mauseo, uh, museum, uh, and that came to museum eventually. But a museum originally, in its first sense, was more like a university than an actual collection of art. Uh, it was where people would come to talk and debate, and uh, there was often a library there for research. Uh, the most famous mauseon uh, in ancient times was the Great Library at Alexandria in Egypt, which eventually burned down. Uh, but universities had not been invented yet either. So this was sort of a combination of a museum by name and a university by practice. Um, so let's see. These are some examples of early collections. Uh, in Greek temples, very often people would make offerings to the gods. Uh, they would bring statues or uh, offerings of food or all kinds of things, pictures, precious stones to the temple as offerings to the gods. And these votive offerings, as they were called, were kept in collections that were meticulously recorded. And there is a possibility that they were put on view and people would be charged an admission to view them. So that was sort of a quasi museum as well. What we have here is just some animal statues made out of bronze. And this is a statue called a Kura, which would be a female statue that was always um, clothed and was usually offering, making offerings to the gods as well. She had a male counterpart called a Kuros, which was sort of an idealized male Greek youth. So these are kind of the things that would appear in these Greek votive collections. Am I going at a good pace? I'm talking kind of fast. Am I going too fast for anybody? No? Any questions? There's some things in the chat. Anybody got anything yet? Um, so far, the chat is empty. Um, most of it was me <laughs> oh. communicating to everyone, but like, uh, yeah, we don't have any questions as of yet. Okay, so everybody's holding on. All right. So yeah, people would bring harvested items, they would bring natural curiosities uh, and things of that nature. And as I said, they were kept in these collections. Another sort of early version of a museum was called a propylia. Uh, and this was a passageway. This is the Parthenon in Athens, and this is what the Propylia is thought to have looked like. This is kind of an estimate of what it might have looked like based on, you know, ruins they found in a reconstruction. But the Propylia was a, you know, kind of a grand entrance up to a major building, and very often there would be a picture gallery there. Uh, the Propylia was sort of a waiting room, sort of like an airport lounge where you'd sort of hang out, have a drink or two, relax before you went to the temple. And they were very often decorated with pictures called a Pinacoteca, which eventually also made it into Latin and even into Italian. And this is a picture gallery once again, but once again, not a purposeful place you went just to look at art. So... Um, now we're going to talk about <clears throat> the variety of stuff that you see in a large museum. Like, let's say you go to the Philadelphia Museum of Art or the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Art Institute of Chicago. These are museums that have large collections of all kinds of stuff, not just statues and paintings. And there are reasons for this that we're going to get into. Uh, you will see things like armor, you'll see dinnerware, you'll see clothing, even the Met Museum in New York has a huge costume institute, and very often that's some of their most successful shows. And uh, the reason for this is that now we make a distinction between art, craft, design, and technology. We think of art as this highbrow stuff that's supposed to inspire philosophical thought or make a statement, so we think paintings and statues. When we think of craft, we think, think of things that are handmade, like baskets or you know carving, things like that, uh, and kind of a folk tradition almost. When you think of technology, you think of machines and you know the advancement of science and machines that do things that we need them to do. And when you think of design, you think of the way something looks, especially when it comes to modern objects. But there was a time when all of these were uh, the same thing. Um, 
there are now museums dedicated to each of these things or museums of technology and design and a museum of craft and all that kind of things. But in reality, the lines are not so carefully drawn. For instance, here you have a gown by Alexander McQueen that was shown um, in a very successful show in 2011 at the Met Museum. And you know, you think of couture fashion as designed for sure, because it's clearly designed, but it's also a craft because it's all, most of it is handcrafted with a lot of hand stitching. And you know, it's all about the craftspersonship of making the thing. Then on the right, you have what's called the Movado Museum Watch, which is actually in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And this is a very classic design. This watch is still very expensive. And it was introduced in 1947 as considered a classic of modern design, but it's clearly technology because it's doing something. It's telling you what time it is, but it's also a piece of design. And very often the idea of design and it looks good also makes you spend more money on it. So these uh, lines are not necessarily even now clearly drawn, even though they do have certain connotations. Uh, event, sometimes the lines are completely erased and redrawn. What we have here is what's now called uh, the Museum of Art and Design in New York. Uh, it's on Columbus Circle, on the south side of Columbus Circle. And it was um, in 2002, uh, refurbished, reclad with a new skin. Uh, and it was refurbished as the Museum of Art and Design. But it had opened originally in 1956, uh, and it was designed by Edward Durrell uh, Stone, who was an architect, and this is a very 1960s design, but it was originally a museum of crafts. Now it's a museum of art and design, even though it pretty much shows the same thing. So the lines are not necessarily clear even in that particular aspect of it. There was a time, however, when these lines did not exist. Uh, this is what's called a, um, we're going to go into the number one museum, reason for the variety of stuff in museums here. This is what's called a cabinet of curiosities. And this is really kind of the origin of the modern day museum. This, these were uh, around in the 1500s, the 1600s. And you have to think this is a time in the world when um, all the explorations were going out of Europe. The new world was discovered. Uh, they were sailing around. The world was circumnavigated for the first time ever. Uh, people were traveling to places they'd never seen before. There are also a lot of scientific discoveries. The telescope and the microscope had just been invented. Uh, so people were getting views of worlds they'd never seen before. There are all kinds of scientific discoveries. This is the era of Galileo and Isaac Newton and Rene Descartes. So there's all this scientific and uh, mathematical thought going on, philosophizing. And so people who are intellectually curious or wealthy enough or upscale enough started these collections called Cabinets of Curiosities. And they could have anything in them that was rare and curious, to use the term of one statement from one of them, uh, they collected animal specimens, uh, a piece of a unicorn horn powder, a piece of the true cross, uh, a seed pod from Afghanistan. Anything that was unusual would go into one of these collections. Uh, and a lot of times they got very large, these collections. Um, let me see. It was also the creation of specialized museum collections. Italy alone recorded over 250 natural history collections. So a cabinet of curiosities could be a cabinet, like a small collection, but they could also be vast rooms. Uh, they were meant to impress as well as to educate. Uh, and this is an example of an especially large collection. Uh, there was a doctor named Sir Hans Sloan, who was an English physician, and he collected during his lifetime over 71,000 specimens of things. And his collection was big enough that it actually was the precursor to the British Museum. Uh, and this is where the British Museum is now. This is not the original building for Hans Sloan's collection, but you see that uh, these collections could get quite large. Uh, so he had a collection that included books, drawings, manuscripts, prints, medals and coins, ancient and modern antiquities, seals, cameos, and intaglios, which is a kind of print, uh, precious stones, agates, jaspers, vessels of agate and jasper, 
uh, crystals, mathematical instruments, pictures, and other things. So that was Sir Hans Sloan's collection, and uh, he died in 1753. And at his behest, uh, the collection was sold to George II, the King of England, and it became eventually the British Museum. To this day, the British Museum is known more as a collection of artifacts, although it does still as well have a big art collection too. So these cabinets of curiosities, I'm gonna give you an example of some of the things people collected. Uh, seashells from all over the world. Uh, this was the collection of Elizabeth Bly, who is the wife of Wh uh, William Bly of Mutiny on the Bounty fame. So she had seashells from all over the world. Uh, Tsar Peter I of Russia had a collection of teeth because he was not only uh, a, not only a uh, the Tsar of Russia, he was also an amateur dentist. So he would pull the teeth of his unsuspecting courtiers and kept a collection of them. Uh, a man named Sir Walter Cope, who was a high-ranking official in the government of James I of England, had in his collection a round horn that had grown out of an English woman's forehead. Uh, the Habsburg royal family of Austria had one of Montezuma's headdresses from Mexico. Uh, people collected dinosaur fossils, even though they had no idea uh, where they came from. They assumed very often that they were dragons or some kind of mythical creature. Uh, they would have human monstrosities, whatever kind of oddities they could find. Like I said, maybe a piece of the true cross or a rumored piece of the true cross, anything they found around that was interesting. Now, these were not just grandma's attic. They weren't just shoving stuff away just for the sake of collecting it. They really were into trying to make sense of the world. Remember, the world was still a very religious place. And religious Religion still had a very major role in the way people lived but it was also balanced with this, you know, scientific discoveries that were being made. So people were trying to reconcile what they thought they knew with what they knew. Uh, so they were very meticulous about these collections and tried really hard to categorize them and figure out what it was they were collecting. Uh, let's see. So when you think about a really big museum like the Met or the Art Institute of Chicago, you have to think of it as kind of almost like a art mall with it's a number of small collections under one roof. Uh, for instance, uh, you know, the largest collection of Indian art outside of India is rumored to be held either by the National Gallery of Art in Canberra, Australia, or by the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. They both claim to have the biggest collection of Indian art outside of India. So that's like a mini Indian art museum in a bigger building. Now, let's see, some museums are a little more specialized. For instance, this is the Prado in Madrid, Spain. One second, please, coffee. The Prado reflected a different kind of collecting because the kings of Spain <clears throat> wanted basically to collect their favorite artists rather than to be comprehensive and have art from all over the place in every time period. So for that reason, the Prado has been very often referred to as a museum of painters and not of paintings. So you might have uh, museums that are really, really specialized, such as the Gustave Marie Moreau Museum uh, in Paris, which was in a building designed by the symbolist artist himself. And so that's uh, there's lots of museums in Paris and even some in New York and other cities <clears throat> pardon me, that are museums dedicated to one artist. And this is one of them in Paris, dedicated to Gustave Moreau. You might have a gallery that specializes in one period of art, like the Neue Gallery in New York. You know, the Met Museum uh, basically specializes in Austra uh, Austrian and German expressionist art. And this is one of their prized possessions, that, that movie, uh, Women in Gold, what was it called? The, the one about the stolen Nazi art. Uh, that, that This is the painting of that movie, the portrait of Adele Block Bauer, that Helen Mirren was in. It wasn't it Helen Mirren was in that thing? I thought, yeah. It's yeah. called The Lady in Gold or something? I thought, yeah. yeah I think it, yeah. Was, it was like Helen Mirren and Ryan, one of the Ryans, who's an actor. <laughs> one of those Ryans. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, there's it's a movie about them acquiring this uh, from a, a museum in Austria that was holding on to it, and it had been looted from this family. Uh, from the Nazis, and they actually donated it uh, because the museum put up such a stink about giving up the painting that they actually donated it to a museum in, in New York instead. Uh, then you might have a museum that's dedicated to one geographic location, like the Seattle Museum of Asian Art, 
Uh, this is a piece uh, by an Asian artist named Do Hu Sa. And the, this is a traditional Chinese robe made out of soldiers' ID tags. So uh, that's kind of an interesting statement right there. But this is a, a museum of, I guess, traditional and also modern Asian art. So one culture can be reflected as well. For instance, in uh, the Hispanic Society, which is a really, really underappreciated museum in New York City. Uh, the Hispanic Society, which is way uptown and kind of hard to get to, and maybe that's why it's a little bit neglected. It uh, has amazing collection of all kinds of Spanish art, including a whole series of murals by the artist uh, Joaquin Soroya depicting uh, Spanish traditional life at the turn of the, uh, the new century, you know, the last century, at the end of the 1800s, he was capturing uh, life in Spain as the modern era was being ushered in. And this is a really beautiful series of murals that are decorating the building. You also might have museums that are dedicated to one very singular vision, such as the Museum of Bad Art in Boston, which I have been to and love. I actually collect this stuff myself. They have a lot of like thrift store art on, on display. Uh, and I think even though these are people who can almost paint and they have incredible ideas, but you know they get frustrated, I think, and then kind of throw them in the garbage and they wind up in a thrift store. And hopefully they get a second life at the Museum of Bad Art. I've collected a number of pieces like this myself. I have a little collection. And then the Museum of Bad Art is actually interested in acquiring one of my pieces, I'll have you know. So uh, there's all kinds of museums that are very, very specialized. Uh, and as I said, as we have made the um, distinction between art, craft, design, and technology, we have museums dedicated to those now as well. I mean, you have to think about, for instance, um, the headdress from Montezuma would probably wind up in an anthropology museum, like the Museum of Natural History or something. Uh, the dinosaur fossils would definitely wind up in the Museum of uh, Natural History. And probably Czar Peter's teeth and anything else that you could put in a jar would wind up in the Mutter Museum in Philadelphia, which is a museum of medical curiosities. It was founded in the late 1800s, and they actually have a cast of the bodies of the original Siamese twins on uh, Chagenang Bunker, who were a sideshow attraction in the Barnum Circus. Other specialty museums that you might be interested in, in Southport, England, there is a museum of lawnmowers. In Houston, Texas, there is the Museum of Funerals. In New Orleans, there is the Voodoo Museum, which I have also been to. In Reno, Nevada, there is a slot machine, slot machine museum. Uh, and there are several museums worldwide dedicated to cheese for some reason. In Guanajuato, Mexico, there's a museum of disinterred mummies for people who could no longer afford to pay their grave uh, rent. Uh, there is several instruments of torture museums, including one in Prague that I visited once. Uh, so there's more museums of torture than you might care to think about. And then there are other museums that are for celebrated individuals. Another really interesting museum I went to that's now closed, unfortunately, was the Liberace Museum in Las Vegas, uh, Nevada. And it was dedicated to the bespangled pianist uh, who charmed an entire generation of grandmothers uh, with his piano tinklings, and they had a lot of his costumes there. It was located in a strip mall, uh, and it was really way outside the strip, but I consider that kind of a specialty museum and a mu cabinet of curiosities kind of all rolled into one. So there are a lot of specialty museums. Now we're going to get into, you know, besides these big museums that have, you know, these large collections of everything. So now we're going to get into another reason why when you go to a big museum, oh, there's the Liberace Museum, uh, another reason why uh, these museums have such a wide variety of stuff when you go to a big museum is the idea that art, technology, design, and craft were once inseparable. <clears throat> Probably this goes back to Neolithic times when people started settling down into villages and civilization began probably around 9000 BC or so. Uh, People started making things, you know, because they were living in villages, had a more stable life. They started raising crops and livestock, and they started making vases and things like that. Pottery, you know, came around, and they started to decorate these objects. 
you know, and you have to think if the same person is in charge of making something to begin with, you know, crafting an object and then decorating it, it kind of makes sense that an artist and an artisan are the same thing. As a matter of fact, the word artisan and artist and the word artificial all come from the Latin word ars, which means to make something with skill. That's the basic definition of art. Uh, and as far as I'm concerned, that's my basic idea of art as well, is to manifest an idea into something. Uh, but that's a little philosophical right now. We're talking about more practical matters, the idea that the arts were all once the same thing. We think about a vase, it's also technology because it replaced hollowed out gourds, which were the main way people used to carry water. Then they made the technology of clay pottery and crafted it and designed it. Uh, so it's all kind of the same thing. And no wonder, you know, all these things were combined into one idea. Uh, so uh, let's see. The definition of what an artist was has to be considered when you go to any museum. And this is, once again, this idea of art, craft, design, and technology. Uh, starting in the late Middle Ages, around the year 1000, 1100 or so, uh, town life really sprang up. Uh, after the fall of the Rem Roman Empire, there was no town life for a very long time. It was very dangerous to travel around, and the feudal system was in place eventually, you know, where there was the big tract of land with the Lord of the Manor and all the serfs working the land and they fought each other and they had their castles and their walls and all that kind of thing. And then eventually that system started to fall apart and towns appeared for the first time since the days of the Roman Empire. Uh, so around maybe the, the end of the Middle Ages, uh, artists and bakers and candlestick makers and tailors and people who did any kind of art or craft banded together to form guilds. And guilds started, like I said, in the 11th century and really gone to the present day. If you think about it, even being a lawyer is sort of a guild because you have to work your way up through the ranks. You know, you start as, uh, you know, uh, an apprentice lawyer again, and you, you work your way up to partner eventually. And that was the idea behind a guild. If you were, you know, a young person, you probably went into the family business, you know, and from the time you were like 12 or something, you would work in the family business and you would join the guild. And, you know, there was a guild for bakers and all kinds of professions. And they were sort of uh, training schools, trade unions. They discovered that there was a lot of power in unity so they could have a big influence on town politics. And artists as well belong to guilds. And this is an illustration from much later of what a guild might have looked like. You know, you have one person in the corner doing a portrait. You have somebody else doing a history painting. You know, you have people drawing from bus, taking their lessons. You know, so you have little kids here being taught. These are obviously the, the newest members of the guild. So as a guild member, you started as an apprentice. You would sweep floors. You would mix the paint. You would mix plaster. Then you would work your way up to a journeyman. And a journeyman would work on the secondary figures in a painting or the scenery. Sometimes they traveled around and lent their talents to bigger artists. Eventually, after becoming a journeyman, you could possibly work yourself up to being a master artist. And how that worked was that you painted a painting or did a sculpture or something that was whatever your guild did. And if it was good enough, they would tell you that you could open your own shop and you could be a master artist and have your own employees. And that is the origin of the term masterpiece, when you presented a masterpiece to the guild and they let you open your own shop. So to give you an idea of how artists were regarded in the past, the terms apprentice, journeyman, and master are still used to this day for plumbers and electricians. So it really was a craft and you worked for, you know, an upscale person, some noble, some pope or something, and the work was made to order. You were told this is, it was just like hiring a high-end decorator. You're told this is what you're painting. This is how much it's going to cost. It was all very contractual and it was you know, dictated to you what you're going to paint. Uh, eventually, uh, by the end of the Renaissance, after you had these singular geniuses like Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, and Raphael de, Sa uh, de Santo, uh, artists started getting a lot more respect. Really toward the 
12th century or so, artists started to be able to hobnob with their patrons because some of them had become very powerful and, and rich in their own right. Even though they weren't the same class of people, they could at least hang out with their patrons. So art started to get a little more respect. And really, the 1100s, 1200s is when we know the names of artists for the first time, because prior to that, they'd always been anonymous. So by the end of the Renaissance in the 1500s, uh, the late 1500s, you know, mid 1500s, you had all these artists who would accomplish these amazing things like the David statue, the Sistine Chapel, the Mona Lisa, all these great works of art. Artists were looked upon as singular geniuses, and the whole idea of what it meant to be an artist started to shift. Michelangelo was actually given permission to do whatever he wanted with the Sistine Chapel. That was almost unheard of. If it weren't for the fact that Michelangelo got brought to the court of Lorenzo de' Medici when he was about 12, 13 years old, he would have had to have joined the Stonecutters Guild just like any other sculptor. So he was considered such a genius that at the age of 12, he was brought to the court of Lorenzo de' Medici in Florence and was surrounded by the greatest minds of the Renaissance. I mean, imagine being 12 and <laughs> that happening to you. I can't even... And even still, his, his genius was recognized at that early age. So when Michelangelo was about 80 years old, he was living in Rome, uh, Cosimo I de' Medici established the first art academy. And this is when artists started actually going to college, when they started to get a full-fledged liberal arts education, just like any noble would get. Uh, they stopped going to a trade school like the guild members had, and they were really sought after for their incredible talents. So the definition of what it means to be an artist is really starting to change here. And this is something you have to think about when you look at any kind of art, you know, from the classical era, that it was ordered by these patrons to aggrandize themselves, to establish their power, the church also to, you know, establish themselves as the powers that be and to keep the institutions in place. And that was the job of the artist was to work for these great patrons. So this is another reason why we have uh, such a wide variety of stuff in museums is this idea that art and craft and technology and design were all the same thing. Uh, and then let's see, let's move on. Yeah, I cover all. This is what I get when I talk too long. I go too far ahead in my notes and I have to scan to see what I'm going to talk about next. So yeah, oh, very often the guilds would have a lot of things that were only sort of loosely affiliated. For instance, in Florence, Italy, uh, painters and pharmacists belong to the same guild because uh, they use a lot of the same materials. Artists would use it to make art and pharmacists would use it to cure disease. So, you know, they, they had a lot in common. So what a guild produced was, you know, a variety of stuff very often. Um, and a lot of times they might have to do things like design stage sets for royal balls at the court or all kinds of things like that. So they were very workshop uh, oriented. So let's see, the first academy was established in 1563. It was called the Academia del Diseño. Diseño, interestingly enough, same thing in French and in Spanish, the word for design and draw are the same words. Diseño means design, but it also means to draw in Italian. In French, it's design, and in Spanish, it's dibujo. I don't know what it is in Portuguese, so sorry. <laughs> My Portuguese isn't up to snuff, so I can't tell you that one. Uh, so this uh, was were also where the high arts were separated from the crafts. So the high arts became stuff like painting, sculpture, music, and architecture, everything else like goldsmithing, stone carving, uh, tapestry weaving, all those were still considered crafts and were under the auspices of the guilds. Uh, let's see. Yeah, and the academy was all powerful. If you did not get hired by the academy, if you did not have you know, your degree through the academy, you did not have a career. This system was really in place all the way through the 19th century, the academic system of you know, having to go to this you know, Royal Academy of Art and study with the great masters. And that's how you had a career. No academy, no career. That all broke down after the French Revolution. Uh, you know, this is the slide where I was supposed to be. I've switched to and I didn't. But this is a, a design from later of what an academy might have looked like. Uh, <clears throat> now, this is a typical piece of academic art 
from you see the 19th century and when i talk about the academic style of art lasted all the way up to almost modern times i mean it uh and the first real break came in the mid 1800s with uh the romantic movement we're going to get into that but this is uh an artist, Elizabeth Jane Gardner, she was married to another academic artist named Adolphe William Bouguereau, who is, they were both very highly regarded French academic artists, but this was the stuff that academic art was about, mostly what they called history painting, big biblical epics, uh, history paintings, you know, big battles from the past, glorious victories, portraits of famous people. And there was a very specific hierarchy of what was the most important art and what was the least important art. So the most important art was history paintings, these big epic paintings that were often huge. And then portraits were kind of underneath that. And then stuff like still lifes and landscape was way down at the bottom of the scale. And landscape wasn't considered worth painting. You know, it was just a background for a history painting. A bowl of fruit, nobody would even give a second thought to. That changed later on, but we'll get into that as well. So uh, in 1791, the French Academy, uh, was, which had been founded in 1648 by Louis XIV, opened due to the revolution, the French Revolution. So the French Academy was the first art academy founded outside of Italy. There was one in Rome after Florence, and then the French Academy uh, was founded by Louis XIV in 1648. Uh, he also established art schools for the, the higher arts, for you know, the, the uh, high arts, uh, the Académie de Beaux-Arts, and uh, they all had their separate schools, and he established the French Academy, and for the most part, our story is going to concentrate on the French Academy from here on in, uh, because that's where the most important stuff happened. So in 1791, this is really, in my opinion, when modern art starts, because after the French Revolution, with the coming of the new government, all of a sudden the academic system broke down and any artist could apply to be in the annual salon shows, which were sometimes every two years. But the academy students and graduates would show their artwork at these salons and the public would come to them. And there were these huge social events that attracted every level of French society and tens of thousands of people eventually came to them, uh, to these academy shows. And that was one of the big events of the season. Um, so, um, yeah, so after the revolution, uh, artists of any type, whether they had gone to the academy or not, were allowed to at least apply to be in the salon shows, and a jury decided whether your, your art could be in the show or not. Um, the academy, the, the jury system that picked who could be in the salon shows was in kind of a sticky situation. Uh, once art was freed from having to, you know, depict these certain subject materials, a lot of artists were encouraged by their teachers to paint things that had more to do with modern life. And this is where we're going to move on to the Impressionists. So um, artists started to paint things that were <clears throat> not, you know, the normal academic kind of subject material, like these big epic paintings. The first movement to break away from the academic model was a movement called Romanticism. And this came around in art and literature in 1820s, you know, 18 teens or so. And as opposed to academic art, which was very stylized, very, you know, measured, very, you know, all about certain subject material, romantic art reflected the times. You have to remember this is the era of Edgar Allan Poe, the Shelleys, Lord Byron getting killed in the Greek War for independence. Uh, the whole focus on art became about expressing grand emotions. A lot of artists were taking a lot of opium and a lot of drinking a lot of absinthe and things. And, uh, you know, they were wild, untamed nature. These big themes of, you know, raw emotions were, were starting to come into vogue. Uh, like I said, Poe, Shelley, Nathaniel Hawthorne was another author who was around at the time. So the focus on what was, art was about kind of shifted and the romantic movement was the first movement to break away from the academic model. And the academy, for its part, had to kind of decide whether or not to absorb these new trends. You know, they had to kind of keep up with the times, but at the same time, they were responsible for holding on to traditions. So they were in kind of a sticky situation with all this new art coming out. After uh, Romanticism came a movement called Realism, uh, 
which I think I have a slide up, but that was all about common everyday subject material. Artists like Gustave Courbet would paint his grandfather's funeral in a small town in France, which was hardly suitable subject material for, you know, a museum. You know, like I said, art was supposed to be about elevated stuff. But really when things took off it was with the Impressionists. Now I have a painting here by Bert Morisot compared to the Gardner academic painting. And we're so used to seeing Impressionist paintings by now that we don't realize how shocking this was to people at the time. You know, and if you put the two next to each other, you can see that to people at the time, this must have looked really like unfinished and just slapdash and sloppy. You know, they wanted their art to look, you know, photographic and not to show any brush strokes. And also the subject material wasn't considered suitable. So it was beyond the what was considered poor painting at the time. There's also the idea that the impression, impressionists were depicting things that were not suitable for artistic purposes. Um, so this is where the academic model really started to break down and um, modern art sort of begins. Now, the next thing we're going to talk about is the history of museums. We're going to continue with where the first proto-museums came into, into uh, being. Because remember, I said in ancient times, they had buildings that had collections of art, but they weren't really purpose-built. So it, in the beginning of the 12th century, uh, when the Crusades were happening, uh, the soldiers started to bring back all this booty from the Middle East back to Europe. So uh, there was uh, a lot of... Um, Religious relics, ancient statues were being dug up, a lot of stuff from the Crusades. Uh, eventually, when the popes moved back to Rome after living in France for a while in the 1400s, they started to rebuild Rome and they started to find a lot of ancient statues that had been un buried underground for hundreds and hundreds of years. So there was a lot of antiquities being found and stuff being brought in from the Crusades. And there were these big collections. These four bronze horses, for instance, are in the Piazza San Marco in uh, Venice in Italy, and they were taken from Constantinople in the early 13th century during the Crusades. Eventually, these kind of proto-museums where they put art on display for the public grew into real museums. This is what's thought to be the first kind of museum by a lot of people, the Capitoline in Rome. Uh, as, like I said, this ancient art was being dug up all over Rome as the, Rome, the popes were starting to rebuild Rome because uh, it had fallen to ruin, remember, during the fall, after the fall of the Roman Empire. So they started uh, putting these antiquities on display. So the Capitoline started in 1471 when Pope Sixtus IV, and he's the one who built the Sistine Chapel, uh, part of the Vatican, uh, and he was an art patron as well. And he don donated four very heavily symbolic bronze statues to the people of Rome as a gift. Uh, it's thought maybe by some people that this generous gift by the Pope was kind of the, you know, little bone in front of the dog, kind of, you know, just to show his power, like, look how beneficent I'm being. I have the power to give you these statues that are so important to you. And that includes the statue of the she-wolf of Rome. It was originally thought to have been made during Etruscan times, even previous to the Roman Empire, but it was actually found fairly recently to have been made during the Middle Ages. And then in the 1700s, to the statues of Romulus and Remus, the two twin brothers who founded Rome, was added underneath. So that statue was one of the gifts to the people of Rome from Pope Sixtus. Bronze statues are also not very common. It was a very rare gift to have bronze statues left over from ancient times because a lot of them got melted down during wars. So uh, these were originally kept outside. Um, and whoops, my little teleprompter, come on. Uh, we talked about that. Yes, we talked about that. So yeah, okay, so these... Um, Statues were originally stored at the Lateran Palace, which is where the Pope lived before he moved into the Vatican. Remember, the Vatican was built really during the 1600s for the most part, uh, the 1500s and 1600s. So the Pope lived in another palace called the Lateran Palace, and the She-Wolf was originally in a spot near the Lateran Palace that were used for public executions. Uh, so these uh, statues were put on display. Eventually, they were put in a building, and the Vatican, uh, the uh, latter, the uh, 
Capitoline Museum's collection grew uh, by fits and starts. Uh, for instance, in 1566, Pope Pius V moved 140 statues there because they were considered too pagan and not Christian enough because they were ancient statues. So, um, so that was the collection grew by 140 statues with that. And then uh, Pope Clement XII acquired over 400 works from a perpetually dead ridden cardinal named Cardinal Albani, uh, Alessandro Cardinal Albani, uh, had had to give his collection to the Pope because he was always owing so much money to the Pope. So 400 more works were added to the collection. And that was the same year that the museum was open to the public. So these, <clears throat> that was considered the first museum and one of the first open to the public. Does anybody have any questions so far? I'm kind of rattling on and on and on. I haven't stopped. Anything going on? People still hanging on? Yeah. Um, as of now, there aren't any questions. In the chats. Okay. Well, then I'll keep <clears throat> rattling on and on and on then. Oops. Next slide. Now, this is the Uffizi Gallery in Florence, Italy. Uh, Uffizi is an Italian word for office, and it was originally designed as offices for the Medici family. Uh, and it was uh, designed by the artist and architect and the world's first art historian, Giorgio Vasari who wrote the first biography of all the great Renaissance artists, because he knew a lot of them and was an artist in his own right. So he um, uh, built the, designed this building to be used as civic offices for the Medici family. And then in 1574, uh, Giorgio, uh, yeah, Giorgio Vasari died. And then Cosimo de' Medici died in 1581, and Francesco I, who was Cosimo de' Medici's son, converted the top floor of the offices into an art gallery. And it was for the family's collection. And it wasn't, you know, just art, it was all kinds of stuff. And some people, once again, think that this might be the world's first museum because it was purposely designed to be a museum, even if the building itself wasn't. The gallery space was a dedicated museum space, so some people argued this might be the first museum. It was given to the state in 1743 and opened to the public in 1769. It is presently under renovation. Uh, the Renaissance rooms have just been redone uh, and were just done in the end of 2016. Now, this is the first time a building <clears throat> was built specifically to house a collection. This is the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford, England, and it was a collection, once again, by a cabinet of curiosities by a man named Elias Ashmole, and uh, he donated his collection to Oxford University with the stipulation they put up a special building to house his collection in. It opened in 1683, and it merged with Oxford's collection in 1908. And it has since become one of the world's foremost museums of curiosities and of art and artifacts uh, from a university. One of the things in their collection is the pieces of the last surviving dodo. What we see here is a historical re you know, recreation of what a dodo would have looked like. Uh, unfortunately, <clears throat> excuse me, the original dodo eventually turned to dust and all they were able to rescue was the head and part of its feet. But I think this may be the only example of dodo DNA surviving on planet Earth, as far as I know anyway. So that's part of the um, Ashmolean Museum. If you have uh, sensitivities, you might want to avert your eyes on the next slide. This is one of the Ashmolean's more curious uh, collected pieces, is a plate, uh, a Mialica uh, piece of pottery. Uh, that was made by an artist named Francesco Urbini in the year 15, in the 1530s. And this is a profile of a man's head made entirely, if you look closely, of penises. And it was thought to be a comment on some of the kind of body literature that was around at the time. So he's making a statement with this plate and uh, the inscription is written in Latin backwards and it says, Every man is looking at me as if my head were made of penises. So it's thought to be a comment on literature at the time. This is one of the weirder things that the Ashmolean has in its collection. Now, as I said, the French Revolution was the main reason for the change uh, toward modern art. And uh, 
the French Revolution, as well as the American Revolution, were um, a result of what was called the Enlightenment. I think everybody remembers this terminology from high school history. The Enlightenment was this great shift in Western European thinking uh, that the common man had rights, that, you know, uh, elected officials should be elected. You know, the Declaration of Independence, the, you know, rights of man that was, you know, put out in France. So the Enlightenment was a whole philosophical shift in the worldview. And part of that worldview was that the common man could be elevated through art. Uh, and uh, so the most basic precepts that people thought were, were rethought, uh, and there was a lot less faith in faith, a lot more belief in scientific inquiry, uh, and you know the idea of the freedom of the average person. I think even in high school and maybe going into adulthood, other people realize what think people realize what a profound idea the idea that anybody had rights had. You know, I mean, the idea that a common person would have rights was even unthinkable until the Enlightenment came along. So it really was a reevaluation of everything and a whole new way of thinking about the social order. It also to a certain degree, embrace the idea that people were improvable, if not perfectible. Voltaire, uh, the Enlightenment philosopher, was notoriously cynical about that idea. Uh, he kind of said, if he said it, he said it tongue in cheek. So this is where the idea of museums came along. And as well, you know, the idea that buildings should be made to, that the public would be allowed to see art, they could elevate them. So the British Museum, for instance, is one museum that came along as a result of Enlightenment thinking because the museum was opened not just for the royalty, but for the benefit of the public to all posterity. And the idea that George II even thought that this was necessary is really kind of profound when you think about it. Like, why would common people need to look at art? I mean, the idea that he actually fell for this is really quite revolutionary when you think about it at the time. Uh, so the idea of getting a British art museum, however, was a little more complicated uh, because this may be one time when Enlightenment thinking may be responsible for a museum not opening. Maybe the idea of opening a British art museum was considered a little dangerous by the British royalty. They might have feared that if they made you know, art too public, that it might kind of dilute art to the lowest common denominator, and you know they didn't want to degrade art in any way. And they also thought that maybe talk about revolutionary ideas and educating the public might be a little bit dangerous. And even remember when I said that after Romanticism, the realist movement came around in France, the idea of painting common subject material was even thought of as kind of revolutionary at the time and a little bit dangerous to educate the common people too much. So the government did drag its feet on buying a few collections, including one that in 19, 1822, rather, that belonged to King George IV himself. Uh, but the National Gallery eventually opened in 1824 when the government got a, good, a deal that was too good to pass up. They got two collections from two collectors for the price of one, and they were able to put up a building because Austria all of a sudden repaid an old war debt, said, oh, OK, we'll put it towards the museum. So they did put up a museum and they did allow the public to come into it. So that is why Brit the first British art museum was built. Now, the Louvre was a little more complicated. Uh, it's nothing short of epic. Uh, the philosopher Diderot, Denis Diderot, who's a French Enlightenment philosopher, came up with the idea of turning the Louvre into an art museum uh, for the general public. Because remember, the French king was now living in Versailles outside of Paris. Uh, outside of Paris, rather. So the Louvre is pretty much empty. And they thought, well, why can't we use it for museum? And uh, actually, Louis XV was amenable to the idea. Uh, remember, Louis XV is the next to last king. Louis XVI is one who got his head chopped off along with Marie Antoinette. So he wanted to open up an art museum. but And he really tried to do it in the Louvre, but the Louvre was just too packed with stuff. For instance, the former king's bedchamber was now occupied by the Institute of Archaeology, and there was like a giant elephant skeleton in the king's bedroom. So every space in the Louvre was filled with something else, and he couldn't find a place to put on, uh, to put up a museum. So eventually, he did put about 100 of his drawings and paintings uh, on display for the public at uh, the Medici Palace, the um, palace that was owned by his great-great-great-grandmother, Marie de Medici. 
uh, and that was the Luxembourg Palace. And uh, yeah, there was also part of the reason for this idea of opening the Louvre Museum was this man whose name was Lafond de saint -Tien. He wrote an anonymous pamphlet in uh, Holland saying that the king's collection needed to be seen by the public to educate them. Uh, and also his main complaint though, was that the new generation of French artists was producing really mediocre art because they weren't exposed to the old masters. So that was one of his main arguments. So he published this pamphlet in the Netherlands and uh, anonymously, and it got back to France. And it also reignited the idea of opening the Louvre as a museum. So Louis XVI tried to open a museum. He was listening to the people and he really tried his hardest. He hired architects to refurbish the spaces. He had furniture made. He had a lot of paintings refurbished and you know bought a lot of art to put in the Louvre. And uh, it just never kind of worked out somehow. Uh, let me see, let me see where we are here. Hold on one second. Yes, 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 yes. Gene, real quick, yes. um, there is a question in the chat. Okay, I'll answer it while I'm looking for where my spot is. Okay, um, so Glenn asked if, if, is there a museum of art paintings by movie stars that dabbled in art, such as Kim Novak? <laughs> like, is there, right, like I a whole yeah. thing of... Not to my knowledge, but there should be because there's yeah. lots of celebrity painters and some of them, are, some of them are really good. Martin Mull, the comedian, was a really good painter. Jim Carrey is actually not a bad painter. Winston mm -hmm. uh, Churchill was a painter. Yes, he uh, was. <laughs> and then there's a lot of people who are like, I actually got as a Christmas present one year. Uh, what, was that? Oh, what was the name of that woman? That, that some Swedish actress from the 60s. Really bad, really bad. You know, it could be in the Museum of Bad Art. And she put out a book. Uh, what the hell was her name? I can't think of her name offhand. But yeah, there's there's a lot of really bad celebrity painters too. So I think there should be if there's not. But to my knowledge, I don't know of one. Yeah. But I think it's a brilliant idea. Yeah. <laughs> I really do. So anyway, Louis XVI tried to open a museum. And um, he, uh, let's see. Where, I'm sorry, I just lost my... Yes, okay. Uh, two years after taking the throne in 1774, Louis XVI tried to open a museum, and he was helped by a man named the Comte d'Angevillier, uh, one of his nobles, uh, was made the new director of the king's buildings. So, like I said, they really tried to get a museum going. Uh, and then uh, in 1779, Louis's little brother, the Comte de Provence, moved into the Luxembourg Palace, which Louis XV had been using to put on art exhibits. But he promised that he was going to get the Louvre going, and he really tried and tried, and it never happened. Just somehow the wheels never got turning, and the Louvre didn't open as a museum until seven months after Louis XIV was executed, and two months before Marie Antoinette was executed, the Louvre finally opened as museum, the, fir the first public museum in France. Another enlightened museum, sort of, was the Hermitage in St. Petersburg, Russia, which was established by uh, Catherine the Great. She had a penchant for collecting art, she built this palace, and as she collected more art, she just made the palace bigger and bigger. A lot of times she bought collections sight unseen, had no idea what she was buying except for a vaguely general idea. She apparently wanted to show that Russia was at the forefront of art, you know, because Russia and a lot of Eastern Europe had always been considered a little bit backward behind Western Europe. And really, Eastern Europe went kind of from the Middle Ages right into the 18th century, kind of all of a sudden thanks to Peter the Great's, you know, Europeanization efforts and Catherine the Great's as well. So she started just collecting all this art and building this palace and nobody ever got to see it because St. Petersburg is really far away. It's almost in Finland and the, it wasn't open to the public at all. And probably almost no, nobody ever got to see the art, but she just kept collecting it and collecting it. And she built a huge collection uh, just because she didn't know what she was buying didn't mean she wouldn't, you know, break out in a fury if she didn't like what showed up on the palace doorstep. She was still a very particular collector, even though she claimed to be, quote unquote, a professional ignoramus. So uh, she was a very sort of enlightenment ruler. She did have Denis Diderot, uh, the French philosopher, as her art dealer. Uh, she did uh, have religious tolerance. She modernized farming in Russia. 
Uh, she did institute a lot of reforms uh, and she, uh, yeah, tried to institute a lot of social reforms. But at the same time, she did not abolish serfdom. So a third of the Russian people were still basically slaves. So she was really kind of contradictory in certain ways. And she did correspond with a lot of the Enlightenment philosophers like Rousseau and Diderot. Uh, the writer Voltaire called her the star of the North and supposedly had a picture of Catherine the Great in his bedroom. Uh, she had a 34 year reign and like I said, just bought thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of paintings. The rest of Europe resented having the best of their culture siphoned off to St. Petersburg, which is so far away. Uh, and there were complaints uh, in France and other countries that nobody was ever going to see this art ever again. And for the most part, they didn't for a very long time because it wasn't open to the public, as I said. Uh, it was probably just to build up Russia's reputation. So uh, finally, three emperors later, Nicholas I in 1852 opened the Hermitage to the public. But it was kind of limited because you were required to wear evening wear no matter what time of day you went. So it wasn't exactly open to your average uh, Russian peasant. You had know, the idea of wearing evening wear. Uh, that rule was abolished a few years later, but it wasn't the most public, public museum. And it's really kind of a wonder that Nicholas I was the one to open it to the public because he's known to have been one of Russia's most uh, repressive czars ever. He instituted a police state because there was a revolution trying to overthrow him the very day that he was crowned. So he really ran a tight ship and ran really tight control over the arts, mostly aesthetically. But he did, despite being a very repressive ruler, open the Hermitage Museum to the public. So whether the Enlightenment exactly had anything to do with his thinking is kind of an interesting question, considering he ran a complete police state. And the arts did flourish under Nicholas, by the way. This is the era of Pushkin and Dostoevsky and a lot of other people, a lot of great art being produced at the time. So eventually, uh, in the late 18th and early 19th century, museums started to be established in the New World. A handful of were established in the Americas, mostly based on European models. So they looked a lot like museums that you'd see in Europe, but a lot of them were more like, excuse me, <clears throat> kind of local museums rather than art museums. And would, you know, some of them would have art that had to do with the local people, things of that nature. Uh, or more science museums and art museums, more like kind of what the old cabin of curiosities might have been like. And this is the era, uh, era when the Asiatic Society of Bengal was founded in 1784. And uh, this is an Indian museum located in Calcutta. The National Mu Museum of Bogota, Colombia was founded in 1824. And this is the Museum of Colombian Culture. Uh, so a lot of the museums were kind of local, but you know, they were based on European models. Now, as far as the first American museum, there's more than one answer. For instance, the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts in Philadelphia opened in 1805 and claims to be the first museum. Uh, but a lot of people argue that because it's also part of an art school. The Wadsworth Athenaeum in Hartford, Connecticut opened in 1842. Uh, and it was an actual museum. And some people argued that it was kind of too late to be the first museum. And then there was the Charleston Museum in South Carolina, which was actually founded before America was a country in 1773. And some people say that doesn't count because America wasn't a country yet. So that's an open argument. And those three are, uh, museums are constantly arguing over who was the first museum, at least online. They each have a statement saying, we were the first museum in America. Got it? Uh, so as far as modern art museums, however, whoops, there we go. These uh, came about in the second half of the 19th century. Museums started pro to proliferate in Europe. Uh, let me see. Partially, I keep, all right, I keep hitting the, the screen wrong and something's coming down. Anyway, so in the second half of the 19th century, museums began to proliferate in Europe partially be out of civic pride and partially out of the new education movement, the idea that you should really send people to school. This was a pretty new idea in the 1800s and building museums was part of this general public education idea. For instance, 50 museums, uh, what does this say? Yes, 
15 museums, 50 museums, five zero museums. I, I didn't have a hyphen in there, so I couldn't read the years. 50 museums opened in Germany between 1876 and 1880. In four years, 50 museums opened in Germany. Also, gas lighting came around, which meant that museums could be open at night. <coughs> Excuse me. And then electric lighting came along, and museums were able to extend their hours even further. Uh, so people who were unable to come during the day could actually go to museum, uh, to the museum at night. Also, uh, in the 15 years before 1887, in Britain, about 100 museums opened in 15 years. So that's an awful lot of building going on. Now, uh, muse modern and contemporary museums started to open in Europe a lot later than they did in America. You have to think after World War II, uh, a lot of Europe was decimated, had been bombed to, to smithereens. Uh, a lot of artists had expatriated to uh, America. A lot of artists had to because they were condemned by the Nazis. So they came to America or other points in Europe to escape the Nazis. Uh, and also the Nazis had quelled all forms of deviant art. You know, under Hitler, there's the degenerate art show where any kind of modern art was banned. So Germany to this day has a bit of a guilt complex about collecting the most bizarre art possible to make up for the sins of the Nazis. And then in Russia, you know, after, uh, you know, uh, they did not have any avant-garde art after the Soviets came in. Uh, Russia was every bit as cutting edge as the rest of Europe when it came to modernism in the early 1900s. Uh, you had artists like Malevich and, you know, a lot of, you know, Kandinsky and a lot of art in Russia was very cutting edge. But when the Soviets came in, they instituted what was called Soviet socialist realist art, which was all, you know, propaganda art. You know, you know, the stuff, you know, the farmers carrying bales of hay and the happy soldiers and the happy families frolicking in the woods. So the, uh, in 1938, I believe it was, Joseph Stalin banned all other forms of art except socialist realism in Russia. So for those reasons as well, Europe was a little behind the times as, founding, as far as founding uh, a modern art museum. So um, post-World War II, the continent was rebuilding, artists had fled to the US, and the art world influence shifted to New York. Paris had always been the capital of the art world, and all of a sudden things shifted, and abstract expressionism became the new art form. Artists like Jackson Pollock, William de Kooning, Mark Rothko, uh, Lee Krasner, Arshel Gorky, a lot of those abstract expressionist artists came around. So America had its own art and started putting up the first modern art museums. So the Phillips Collection in Washington, D.C. was the first, and that went up in 1921. And then in 1929, the Museum of Modern Art opened in New York. Then you have a lot of museums that uh, are outside the Eurocentric sphere. You know, when you think about a lot of European museums, they tend to focus on European art, but then there are a lot of museums in other countries where they tend to focus on their culture you know, because the museums are there to assert a certain people's identity and to show the nation's power and civic pride. So some museums like the National, uh, there we go, the National Museum of Modern and Contemporary Art or the MMCA in Seoul, South Korea uh, is international in scope. This was open uh, in the early 2000s and in 2011, it became the first museum in Asia to show the work of artists from the New York's Whitney Museum. So it tries to be international in its scope, but a lot of museums focus more on their own cultures. So then you have uh, nearly 10,000 years of history is represented at the Shanghai Museum in China. Uh, and they have 120,000 ancient Chinese artifacts uh, and that number would be much smaller if it weren't for the fact that a lot of the staff at this museum worked very hard during the Cultural Revolution when Mao Zedong was trying to destroy all the imperial art. The museum directors, a lot of people who worked for the museum and a lot of private citizens as well, hid away art that the uh, communists were trying to destroy and at great personal risk. And for that reason, they have a lot of artifacts that might otherwise have been destroyed in this museum during the Cultural Revolution. 
Then you have this one, which just went up pretty recently. This is the Zeitz Museum of Contemporary Art in South Africa. And this is in Cape Town. And it represents artists from no earlier than the year 2000. So when you talk about contemporary art, it's about as contemporary as it gets. And it includes nothing but African artists and artists from the African diaspora in its collection. It did receive some criticism for going up in a kind of high scale, you know, upscale neighborhood. But it's a really interesting architectural building. It was a former grain silo. So they carved into a lot of those towers where the grain was stored and made a really interesting architectural space out of it with all these weird little rooms. I've never been there. I would love to go just to see it. Uh, so this is uh, an art in our museum that reflects an, its own culture as well by exclusively focusing on Black artists from Africa or from outside of Africa. Then you have a number of smaller museums that are dedicated to a single theme. For instance, this is the Calico Museum of Textiles in Amenabad, India, which shows saris, tapestries, and royal garments that date back 500 years. So that's a very small cultural single item museum. The Nairobi Railway Museum in Kenya traces this history of what was called the Lunatic Express. This was a railway, a railway that was built by the British during the colonial days and it was only replaced in the year, let me see. Uh, let's see. Oh, I thought I had it in there. No, the, the, I've, the, the railway is, the Lunatic Express has only recently been replaced. I don't have the exact year. Sorry, I thought I did. But one of the trains from this museum was actually featured in the 1985 movie with Meryl Streep out of Africa. So that is a museum dedicated to the Nairobi British Railway. Uh, then you have a number of museums in oops, a number of museums in other places like in North America, and for instance, that are dedicated to the work of indigenous people. For instance, you have the National Museum of the American Indian, which is in New York and in Washington, DC. You have the Nixon Museum in British Columbia, Canada, which focuses on their native art. So there's also a new approach to indigenous art taking place in the contemporary world where they're forgoing hiring, you know, fancy architects to put up flashy architecture and have an international collection. There's, for instance, a museum going up in, that opened fairly recently in Costa Rica that's all about the different cultures of Costa Rica. And it's not put up for the general public of the world. It's put up for the Costa Rican people themselves. So that's a new idea when it comes to museums. And now we're, we're going to finish with two last topics. One is the object, the subject of repatriation, because we have time to talk about this. We're finishing eight, uh, 15 minutes late. Left. So we're going to talk about the subject of repatriation, because this is a very hot topic right now. Uh, a lot of how museums acquired their collection is kind of shady at best. You know, I have to remember through colonialism, a lot of um, art was just kind of taken away, you know. Uh, and one example that's really hot uh, item of contention right now is what's called the Elgin Marbles. These are in the British Museum and they were taken from the Parthenon in Greece uh, during the 18th century, 19th century by a British Lord uh, who was a collector of antiquities. Now this Lord Elgin came to Greece and as I said, he was a collector of antiquities. And when he saw the Parthenon, he was appalled by what he saw because the building was had fallen completely into ruin uh, during one uh, war between the Ottoman Empire, which occupied Greece at the time, and the city of Venice in the 1700s. Uh, the Parthenon was being used to store gunpowder and a Venetian bomb hit it and turned it into an instant, an instant ruin. The people of the local people were in the habit of, you know, just burning the pieces of the building to make quick lime to make new buildings out of. They were hawking pieces of it to foreign tourists, and the whole place was just dilapidated. Uh, and so he decided uh, that he should take these back to England for safekeeping. Uh, at the time, it was looked at even by certain people as plunder. Lord Byron wrote a poem about it called the the uh, the Rape of Minerva was the name of his poem, and he called Lord Byron a plunderer. Uh, so there's two sides to the story. 
he did receive permission from the Turks who were occupying Greece at the time. He did get permission to take any or some pieces of stone away with him or to make copies of them or drawings of them. And what's tricky about this is that they were using an Italian translation of the original order, which was written, you know, in Arabic or, you know, whatever, Greek or something. Uh, and they translated it into Italian, supposedly so that Lord Elgin could read this agreement. Uh, but the funny thing about Italian, like with most Romance languages, is the word for some and the word for any is the same word. So he was allowed to take some pieces of stone or any pieces of stone. And that's the tricky thing about the Italian translation. So there might have been some bribery on the part of the public officials in Greece. You know, it was all very kind of skullduggery uh, and it wasn't considered legitimate even at the time. Now, on the Greek side of the argument, uh, it does belong to Greece, first of all. It's part of one of their most famous buildings. The Greeks also put up a Parthenon museum recently, which could easily house the, the original uh, Elgin marbles, but are now housing a, a reproduction of them. Uh, so they also, they want their marbles back. So uh, Lord Elgin eventually died in poverty. He sold the collection to the British government for about half of what he paid for it. Uh, and he died in poverty, having lost his nose to some kind of disease and his wife to one of his best friends. Uh, so he died in poverty. Uh, but uh, let's see, what are you saying here? Yeah, uh, so the Acropolis Museum was constructed a quarter mile from the Parthenon in 2009. And to this day, it has attracted 1,425,100 visitors in 2016 alone. So it's a very famous museum and very popular museum and they want the Elgin marbles back to put on display. And it has become more acceptable these days to refer to them as the Parthenon marbles rather than the Elgin marbles. So the British government hasn't given them up, and this is one major example of a repatriation issue. Also, a lot of weird stuff is in museum limbo. They have, in a lot of museum collections, stuff that you just can't show anymore, like shrunken heads, and a lot of body parts that were, you know, ancestrally buried, buried or something, you know, according to the customs of native people. And now this stuff is kind of in museum limbo because they don't know what to do with it, but they can't put it on display either. And they've got to kind of keep it and keep it in good shape. So repatriation is a whole issue. Now we're going to end with the one story of the only ancient museum we know about. Remember what I said, the idea of collecting, you know, items from civilizations past was never thought of really until more modern times, but there was an exception in ancient Mesopotamia. In the 1920s, an explorer named Leonard Woolsey, Woolley rather, not Woolsey, Woolley, was exploring in the ancient Mesopotamian city of Ur, and he found a building from the 6th century BC. Now, what was funny about this building was even though it was from the 6th century BC, it had artifacts from the entire span of Mesopotamian history. And he didn't know what this meant. He found some cylinder seals with these little round things that they used to write with. You know, they're kind of round, almost like a you know rolling pin with a design on it that they would write things with or use for signatures. And these signature seals had on them descriptions of the items in the museum in three different languages. So he didn't realize it at the time, but he had stumbled on what was called the Museum of Princess Enigaldi Nana. Now, Princess Enigaldi was a high priestess of the moon, and she was the daughter of a king named Nabonidus. And he was the kind of illegitimate ruler uh, he had no ties to the royal family whatsoever of a kind of illegitimate dynasty. It was called the Chaldean or the Neo-Babylonian uh, dynasty. And they weren't real attached to history particularly, uh, but they did claim the, the throne. Uh, and their most famous ruler was Nebuchadnezzar II. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar II was actually named after a Nebuchadnezzar the first who had ruled thousands of years earlier. And that the reason I'm bringing that up is because the whole idea between behind the Chaldean Empire was to recreate uh, the 
magnificence of Babylon, Babylon, the city of Babylon, when it was ruled by Hammurabi thousands and thousands of years earlier, and to bring it back to his former glory, and also to kind of legitimize this ruling house that had kind of taken the Mesopotamian throne illegitimately. So to that effect, they started putting up you know, reproductions of buildings that had stood thousands and thousands of years before. They, re, you know, reproduced ziggurats. It stood, you know, it'd be like now, you know, modern Rome trying to reconstruct ancient Rome. But it was all to legitimize their rule and all to bring Babylon back to its former glory. Uh, and the museum was part of that story, too, to put a collection together that showed all the historical artifacts of Mesopotamian history. Uh, unfortunately, Nabonidus turned out to be the last uh, Chaldean ruler. Uh, his empire was overthrown by Cyrus the Great, and uh, Cyrus the Great decided to make Babylon his capital city and did not destroy it. Uh, but this is the only known ancient museum in the world. So that is pretty much where we end our talk. Once again, this is me. If you want to get in touch with me or ask any questions, do you have any comments or questions? Because we still have a couple of minutes left. Feel free. I, yeah, I don't see any in the chat right now, but maybe some people will ask them in the next minute or so. Okay, so feel, or, or you can unmute yourself. No. Okay, well, should we just call it a day then? Say we covered everything? We can, yeah. Um, Okay. Oh, I see a couple of questions right now. Okay. Oh, questions. Have come. Okay, good. Well, someone said thank you. Oh. <laughs> it was excellent. Um, and then Glenn asked if you recommend any online art galleries or art museums, I guess. Well, the thing is, there is a thing called Google Art Project, which is, uh, they have gone to tons of museums, I think like a couple of hundred museums by now. And they take photographs, real high resolution photographs of the buildings themselves, and also of their, you know, chosen works from the museum's collections. And they're so high resolution that you can really focus in on the littlest, tiniest detail, and it won't be pixelated. So I would recommend looking for stuff on Google Art Project. And I think a lot of another really good resource is what's called the Heilbrunn uh, timeline of art is put up by the Metropolitan Museum. And they have a couple of thousand, I think like 7,000 essays about some of the objects in their collections, you know, historically, like what they mean. And they'll have like about 10 different things for a certain time period. And some scholar will have written some kind of essay about it. So I'd recommend that as well. Uh, and I think most museums do have some kind of online presence where they'll at least show you what's in their collection. Yeah, I actually, I just shot a link to the DIA, which is in our own backyard. Um, it has like a, obviously has links to samples of its collections, which span everything. Um, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, I think most museums would have some kind of indication online, some kind of online presence at this point. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If you want to just look up artists, there's also a lot of um, sites like I think there's one called Sachi Art. There's a lot of sites where artists who just post their work, you know, artists of any type can just post their work and you can just look at all kinds of art online at some of these online sites. I forget what other ones there are. Sachi Art is one of them. I think that was sponsored by the Sachi Art Galleries. And there's a couple of, uh, I forget what the other ones are called. I'm sorry. But there are art, art sites where any artist can post their work. And those are kind of interesting to go through as well. Yeah. Anything else? Um, yes. Helene's raising her hand. I will allow her to talk. She might need to say something. I'm unmuting myself. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, thank you. This was wonderful. The only thing is, I thought I got an email that this will be a talk about the muses. For whatever oh, reason. Well, well, the muses, the place, the place of the muses. Let's talk about the muses, shall we? Actually, I kind of left that out. I should have. No, no, I mean, the, the, the point is, I like all your programs, and they don't have to be all together all at once. But I like to be part of it and not to miss any of your talks. 
which yeah. are marvelous, you know. Oh, thank you so much. It's a great comment. Well, you know, actually, we should talk about the muses, though, because the Greeks did have nine goddesses that were called muses, and they were thought to be the inspiration for the arts and the sciences. Oddly enough, they did not have a muse for visual art, <laughs> which is kind of strange, but uh, that's what the museum originally meant. That was the terminology. It meant the place of the muses, like where you went to summon the muses to inspire you in your studies. Thank you. I, I kind of referred to that when I said that museums were originally kind of uh, universities oh. more than they were museums as we think of them now. But yeah, I kind of forgot to mention that. So I'm glad you brought that up. Thank you. Thank you. And please let, let me know or everybody else know when is your next talk? I don't, I don't well, want to miss. <laughs> no, if you go to the six hour art major com. That's where uh, there, all my classes are listed. I do a lot of libraries, actually. And so most I, 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 say it again. That it's the the -E sixhourartmajor.com. It's right here on your slide there, this bottom website here. The sixhourartmajor.com. Yes, that yeah. is where all my classes are listed. And then in, I think it's July, I'm going to be doing my teenage drawing class again in the Troy Library. So if you know any teenagers who want to learn how to draw or are interested in drawing, That'll be at the Troy Library this coming summer. Thank you. I read it once, it went pretty well. So we'll do it a second time, it'll be even better. It's yeah, and I really... you, you have terrific program. This one was marvelous. It, it, thank and you. the other one, I forget which one, but it was also marvelous. So <laughs> well, I was kind so of in, 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 in my dream world when I was hearing you talk. Beautiful, thank you. Well, thank you. I'm glad, I'm glad it's interesting to people because ah, you, you uh, lose track of this yourself. You, you're just kind of talking to a green light and I, I try to look at Eric every so often to realize that yes there are humans out there but um yeah it can it can be a little you can get kind of into your own thing and forget that you're talking to people and you wonder how you're doing when you don't have oh, you're any doing beautifully beautifully I'm glad you you unmuted me so I could say something well, thank you. I'm curious where the other people are, but I'm sure other people also are watching. Or whatever. Well, yeah, a yeah. lot of people don't show up a lot. So people sign up for things and they don't show up. It happens. I've had people pay three hundred dollars to take a class and then not show up for even one session of it. <laughs> it was like, really, I wish I had that kind of money to throw away. But uh, no, really, unmute anybody, especially if you want to give me compliments. Feel free. <laughs> Unmute anybody you want. I, I just took a chance of raising my hand, but I didn't know if I'll be heard or anything. So maybe other <laughs> people are also like this. What do I do? <laughs> oh, just raise your hand or just unmute yourself and just blurt out whatever you want. Yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, thank you very much. I appreciate thank it. Thank you that. very much. No, that really means a lot to me. It's very satisfying. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Very appreciate. Well, I get, you know, I get a lot of stuff. Yeah, even teaching art. Like, you know, I have a lot of stories of, you know, like, or like that. When I taught that drawing class for the teenagers, I discovered, I don't know if she was from Troy necessarily, but uh, she was 11 years, there's a little boy, no, there's a the little girl was in Chatham, New Jersey, she was 12, and there's a little mm -hmm. boy in Troy, Michigan, who's 11 years old, he could draw like a professional illustrator. Oh, wow. And then I also have like people who have, a lot of my studio students have, you know, deficits because I teach seniors for the most part. Mm -hmm. And so I have people with Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and seeing them able to do art or to have people who've never done art in their life. And all of a sudden at 70, they discover that they have a talent for drawing. That's very satisfying. So hearing that from you about the lecture is also very satisfying. Love it, love it. The nice. history and everything like that. Beautiful. And it yeah, connected thanks. in such a way, meaningful way. Good. A lot of pictures too. A lot of pictures helps. <laughs> keeps people Keeps people interested. Yes. Is there anything else in the chat or to any other questions? Or um, I don't see any more. So you're saying in the six hour major, whatever that is, th th there is like calendar, the calendar, what talks you do where and what can sign up? Is that what it yes, is? Yes, the links are posted. Everything is posted there. Oh, okay, thank you very so much. It's, it's usually pretty up to date too. I mean, yeah. I try, it's, you know, I don't have a person to do that. I don't have, I don't have people. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not enough of a person that I have people. Uh, no, no, that's not true. You have. Well, I don't know I, where well, they are, but you have. <laughs> well, it's enough. It is a fact that I don't have people. So yes, yeah, so updating my website is my own job. <laughs> so yeah, uh, I try you. to keep it up to date as much as possible, but it usually is pretty good. So terrific. Thank you. All right. Thank thanks. You. So if there's nothing else, should we call it a day? Well, there's one last question. Okay, so, um, real quick. Um, there's one question from Glenn, but it 
just asking, it says, what is goth? And I don't know what that's in reference to. Um, I can unmute Glenn and see if we can ask them what that meant. I'm talking about goth art. Like goth art. Okay. That's what I thought you meant, but I wasn't sure. Okay. Well, goth gothic art. Okay. Gothic art starts really at the end of the Middle Ages, like in around the year 1000, 1100. You know, Gothic art, you know, think of Notre Dame Cathedral, St. Patrick's Cathedral. That's the Gothic style of art. And it was actually invented in France. Uh, the first Gothic church was called Saint Denis, and it's in a suburb of Paris. And it's kind of had some of the features of what we now call Gothic cathedrals. But because it originated in France, it was thought of by as barbaric by the Italians, you know, because it, you know anything that wasn't Ital it wasn't Latin in Italy was considered barbaric. So Gothic cathedrals, you know, and Gothic architecture, uh, which eventually, you, if you go to Italy, you see very little Gothic architecture because they didn't really like it very much. A lot of it was in France and England and places like that. So that is the origin of Gothic art is in the Middle Ages. It's a style, you know, derived from the importance of the church, trying a whole new philosophy of religion, you know, where it, it much more, ele you know, elevated the stained glass windows were to allow God's light into the building and the spires aspire toward heaven. So it was a whole lighter philosophy toward uh, religion as well. And the church was the center of town life. So then uh, this Gothic cathedral style, which originated in France, became very dominant in Europe and lasted longer in the north part of Europe because that's where it originated. And, you know, it went into England all the way up into the 1600s, long after it had died in other places. So there are a lot of Gothic revivals. And the goth that we think about now, you know, like bands dressed in black and, you know, dark, creepy stuff and Edgar Allan Poe and black eyeliner and all that stuff we think of as goth now is based on the gothic revival that happened in Victorian England in the 1800s. And, you know, that's where goth took on the kind of dark, creepy aspect because Victorian England was kind of a creepy place underneath all the, you know, grandiosity and the proper behavior of Victorian England, there's a definite dark side as well. Uh, but originally Gothic architecture is all about light and about a new attitude toward religion and beauty on earth. And, you know, the buildings were meant to inspire people and to put a sense of awe into them and only became associated with dark, creepy stuff in the Victorian era. But there have been a lot of Gothic revivals ever since. As a matter of fact, I live in a Gothic revival building from the 1920s. There's a lot of Gothic features in my building in the lobby and stuff, even though it's partially Art Deco and partially Gothic. So Gothic has a lot of revivals in the 80s, you know, with bands like, you know, Susie and the Banshees, a lot of Gothic music like that, that look, you know, but that's what we think of as Gothic. So I, pretty, I think that answers your question. That was a really long answer to a pretty short question. It's a three, three word question and a 20 minute answer. All right. Any any other questions? Um, someone else raised their hand. Nancy raised their hand. I'm gonna unmute her. Okay. Hi, Jean. Um, I just want to say this was absolutely fantastic. And, Thank you. Um, I I saw your um, uh, presentation on the tutors and also the one on Andy Warhol. And I, I, you're you're very interesting. It's absolutely fantastic. And I hope you do more presentations here at the um, Troy Library because I've learned a lot and they've been totally enjoyable. So thank you. Well, thank you. And I'm going to, that, that'll give me a chance to do my little spiel about libraries and how important libraries are to the fabric of your community. Support your <laughs> library because they do a lot more than just lend out books. They have yeah. stuff like this. They do, I don't know what kind of services you offer at the Troy Library, but they do a lot more than just give books. So, Library is important and make sure they get funding and make sure you support them. Right. And that dovetails with what I wanted to say with um, be sure to check out the Friends um, of the Troy Public Library's bookshop on the weekends. Um, it's open Saturday and Sunday. Saturday, it's from 10 to 1. Sunday, it's from 1 to 4. 
where you can buy used books from the friends um, because all of those proceeds from the friend shop comes back to us to do programs like this. Um, so we can pay our presenters to do really cool programs from all over the country um, about all sorts of things. <laughs> so yes, um, yeah. real quick though. So Glenn asked again in the chat, like what the word means, like is there just a single definition for goth or gothic? I'm not sure what the origin of the actual word is, no. I mean, I could look that up, but I, I don't really know offhand. Yeah. But I don't think, I don't, I mean, I don't think there's a single definition of goth. I think it's been kind yeah. of, it, it's a period in history at the late Middle Ages that's been kind of reinvented as something else. So yeah. I don't think there is a, a single definition for it because the modern definition of goth really has nothing to do with what gothic architecture was originally about. No. Yeah, the thing is also art of the Middle Ages is looked down upon for hundreds and hundreds yeah. of years. <laughs> During the Renaissance, they didn't think anything about medieval, medieval art. Yeah. And so the medieval art, medieval period in general was thought to be dark and creepy. Yeah. So that's another interpretation of it. You know, even though officially it was really all about, like I said, stained glass windows and spires right. and beautiful detailed architecture and, and a whole illumination. <laughs> illumination, exactly. Yeah illuminated manuscripts too right, which had gold right. and silver in them um so the gothic period was looked down upon later as you know a period into artistic degradation so that's also probably why it became associated with creepiness people just thought the dark ages were dark right you know and they didn't realize that it was just a different philosophy that the art was every bit as legitimate as the art that came later or before yeah. so i don't know if there's a single definition of it i think it's a time period that has been reinterpreted in a sort of incorrect way yeah so anybody else that's it